Much like the strange Shadow Man living in the back of my closet, the VHS franchise is a franchise that simply refuses to die no matter how many child sacrifices I make. VHS 85, being the 85th entry in the series, takes the incredibly original and unique idea of putting a handful of found footage short films together and doing the exact same thing again. Much like the previous entries in the series, the tapes contained within VHS 85 all take place around a frame narrative, an interlude between the stories consisting of its own story named Total Copy and directed by David Bruckner, the director who brought us the 2022 Hellraiser movie that asks us what if we gave Pinhead a hell or see, as well as being the director of one of my favourite lesser known movies, The Ritual. It follows the story of a scientist named Dr. Spratling and his research team after the discovery of this funny looking alien boy. Much like how humans love to do, they take this possibly scared, innocent creature and proceed to lock it up in a test chamber where they proceed to prod and poke it until it does something cool. Being a shapeshifter, that they've named Rory, they attempt to initiate dialogue with the creature by exposing it to some of planet Earth's highest and most prestigious art. Trash TV. Rory begins to mimic some of the things he's witnessing on the TV, with him shapeshifting into one of the most terrifying creatures that the world has ever seen. A woman. After that, he proceeds to shock everyone on the team, as despite him having absolutely no contact with one of the researchers named Gary, Rory's able to somewhat mimic his appearance, causing Dr. Spratling and everyone else to realise that he can see right through the one-way mirror like the creepy uncle. Despite Gary being incredibly uncomfortable with this discovery, and another member of the team leaving the project due to her thinking that Spratling is straying too far from their original plan, Dr. Spratling begins to become obsessed with Rory, with him thinking that he stopped morphing because he's become sick. Sick and tired of being locked in a room probably. And after being sick and tired of being locked in his bedroom, it then cuts to raw footage of Gary in a protective suit as he enters Rory's chamber for the first time to give him a shot of adrenaline. But much like all little boys, Rory's not exactly keen on being stabbed by a random stranger's needle, so suddenly wraps a tentacle around him. And after Spratling and another member of the team comes running to Gary's aid, Rory wraps another tentacle around his torso as he loves a good cuddle, before dragging him away into the room and killing the other researcher. Spratling and the cameraman, who for some reason is still recording and hasn't immediately dropped the camera to run, flee to the other end of the facility where they realise that they can't get out. Rory attacks and kills the cameraman for shaking the camera so much and giving everyone motion sickness, before Spratling begins to try and reason with the weird space hentai tentacle. But Rory, having had enough of hearing his words, hits the permanent mute button on him before dragging the bodies back to his room where we see that he only wanted them in order to mimic the exercises that he had witnessed on the TV. Directed by Mike Nelson, the director behind the 2021 reboot of Wrong Turn, the movie about the funny people living in the woods, the first tape, named No Wake, is arguably one of VHS 85's biggest highlights. It follows a group of friends as they're driving in an RV out to a lake, and after arriving and finding a sign that says no swimming, they immediately proceed to swim. And after a while of playing around in the water and partaking in some water skiing, another car appears on the shore, and apparently this person is a real stickler for the rules, as they immediately proceed to kill everyone. Everyone. One of the friends Robin is on the back of the water ski as everyone's having a fun time, when suddenly the distant and faint sound of a bang can be heard, quickly followed by Robin having a little ouchie. She falls into the water and blood begins to pool, when suddenly bullets start flying towards the boat, politely relieving people of various body parts, as I guess they don't really need them anyway. With them unable to flee and the engine being destroyed, they desperately attempt to cling to what little cover they have, immediately followed by another barrage of bullets tearing through the side of the boat and their various and internal organs. And after taking a nice little beauty nap, suddenly all of the victims wake up as their bodies have been absolutely riddled with bullets. Thinking that being shot is only just a frame of mind, they push the negative thoughts aside as they realise that Kelly is missing the entirety of her jaw. After finding what's left of it and holding it in place until they reach the shore, they realise that despite being filled with more holes than Spongebob, they feel absolutely fine. In fact, they feel good. With no sign of their friends on the shore, or the mysterious car that arrived, suddenly sprouted arms and then shot them all, they discover the number 7 drawn on the side of the RV in Roman numerals. Realising that the Romans must be back to conquer the world again, they suddenly find the remains of their friends who didn't get on that boat. The people who met their end on land stayed dead, while the people who were killed after interacting with the water had come back to life because hydrating is important. Despite their brains, guts and jaws hanging out like they've just had a night on the town, they realise that they can check the footage back to get the license plate of the car so that they can go and do the exact same thing to them because sharing is caring.
Tape 2, directed by Gigi Guerrero, who'd previously directed an episode for The Purge TV show, is named God of Death and follows a cameraman of a Mexican news station as he and his fellow employees face the unfortunate reality of gravity. While beginning to film a segment with news anchor Lucia, an earthquake hits the city before a piece of ceiling hits Lucia. A very real and violent earthquake that hit Mexico City in 1985 that resulted in over 5,000 people losing their lives. And after Lucia's crushed, with almost every other member of the crew, the cameraman Luis regains consciousness after a group of rescuers arrive to try and scrape Lucia off the floor. After getting Luis free, they begin frantically looking for another way out of the building as it's beginning to crumble around them. And after a while of searching, one of the rescuers is impaled by multiple metal bars as an aftershock hits, to which these rescuers, whose job it is to rescue people, kill the man. Uh didn't like him anyway. After their friend decided to give birth to multiple metal bars, they begin crawling through an air vent before falling out of it and finding themselves beneath the building. While hearing screams in the distance and getting giddy at the thought of killing someone else, they find themselves in an old underground cave with ancient paintings on the wall. And after admiring the cool graffiti, they suddenly stumble across the symbol of Mictlan. Mictlan being the underworld of Aztec mythology and generally not a very good time. Something then begins to speak to them through one of the rescuers as a weird 1980 alternative to cell phones, saying that our god has risen from the underworld. He then gorges himself with a metal bar, as apparently these guys love their metal bars, before pulling out his own entrails. After showing off his rather strange modern art piece, he kills another one of the rescuers, when suddenly something large appears behind him before ripping out and eating his heart for the extra protein. With only Luis and one of the rescuers named Carla left, Luis is pulled away and thrown to the floor by the creature, and gets up to see that Carla and all of the bodies have disappeared, as we've apparently apparently got a really considerate clean murderous monster. Carla then suddenly stabs Luis with a metal pole for what she describes as the god of death before taking off all of her clothes because it's kind of stuffy down here. After pulling out his heart and offering it to the creature, the tape comes to an end with the god of death rising and some naked chick screaming about something. Tape 3, named TKNOGD, is directed by Natasha Kumani, known for directing the Shudder original Lucky, as this tape asks the important question, what if virtual reality was evil? but it's 1985. It begins with multiple cameras filming a woman on stage, who proceeds to ask the audience if any of them believe in God, immediately followed by her telling them God is dead. Well okay then. So after single-handedly solving centuries of conflict and strife, she then begins to play footage of someone showing off a virtual reality glove that allows you to feel digital objects. The anime fans are gonna love this one. The man on the video then shows off a virtual reality suit and a helmet that he refers to as his iPhones because earphones are for losers. We then see that the woman has a suit and helmet of her own as she's about to jump into the metaverse to get a winner winner chicken dinner battle royale, but first she's gotta do some weird shit on stage. After putting the suit on and becoming the predecessor to the disgusting Twitch streamer, she feeds a live stream of what she's doing through a projector like it isn't supposed to be 1985. She then makes some strange noises into the microphone when suddenly something that shouldn't be there appears on screen because it hates ASMR and is here to kill it. After putting the helmet on to have a little look around, she falls for the old bamboozle of having your Oculus Quest gorilla glued to your face as a creature appears and lifts her from the ground that causes her to levitate. After being dropped to the floor, she removes the glove to realise that it's removed her hand, and with her in desperate need of a hand, she's thrown into the air before the creature decides that she could really use an extra bend in her leg. It snaps that leg and pulls the other one clean off, because video games are bad for you. With her now lying on the floor, twitching in a bloody pulp, a cameraman approaches her as she's whispering something, and pulls back the helmet to reveal that the inside of her head has been morphed with the circuitry of the helmet, bringing a new meaning to the term helmet head. The tape then comes to an end, with the audience applauding, unaware of what they've just witnessed. Tape 4 named Ambrosia, also directed by Mike Nelson, is a continuation of the story where everyone had a fun day out on the lake while indirectly serving as a warning for people who want to have a family. Don't. It begins at a celebration for a young woman named Ruth, as I assume she's either pregnant, engaged, or recently the perpetrator of a recent horrific mass murder. 
I haven't quite made my mind up yet. And for a split second, we see that one of her family members has a number 7 Roman numeral tattoo, meaning yes, my suspicion was true, Ruth is pregnant and also engaged. After handing the camera to her cousin James, who has this cool ass haircut, she's shot at by a homicidal little kid in his water pistol, who tells Ruth that he got it from a random lady in an RV. Information that is alarming to Ruth, as she's the only weird lady supposed to be talking to random children around here. And after a while of walking around the house, possibly being pregnant or engaged, her mother sits everyone down for a speech. A speech where she proceeds to talk about an ancient family tradition that they all love so much. Ah, oh, you know, just the brutal and unforgiving murder of seven random people once you come of age. Normal upper class stuff. A tradition that everyone in the room seems to have upheld, as they've all been given their cute little matching seven tattoos. Ruth decides to play a tape, showing her fun little lakeside vacation, and after the tape plays, and they all admire and laugh at her clear craftsmanship for the sport as she nonchalantly fires into a tent occupied by people, when the police suddenly arrive outside of the family home. A minor inconvenience to put a damper on things at the party, but nonetheless not a big deal, as everyone packing heat. After handing out guns to everyone, Ruth's mother casually telling her that she either fights or takes her own life because being taken alive would disgrace the family's name. And you know, not all of the innocent killing. They all immediately begin to open fire, and Ruth even shoots her own cousin James after he refuses to take part in the fight. And after deciding that the best place to fight out a siege is to kinda awkwardly lean up against a bed, she pretty quickly finds out that it isn't a good place, as she's pretty quickly riddled with bullets. Sometime later, she appears to randomly wake back up again as the coroner's checking her pulse, to which she doesn't react kindly to this random stranger touching her, and shoots her. She immediately opens fire on literally everyone, including herself, which does doesn't seem to work very well, as the friends from the first tape went lying about doing the same thing to them as they filled the water gun up with water from the lake and told the little boy to shoot the strange lady over there. So being quite literally unable to die, much to the dismay of the family name, she's taken in alive by the police for a stern telling off. After the tape showcasing My Average Family Gathering has ended, Tape 5, directed by Scott Derrickson, the director of The Black Phone, Doctor Strange and Sinister, begins with a person engaging in the fun, wholesome activity of breaking into a house and committing a horrific murder. We see from the killer's point of view, as he breaks in, grabs a kitchen knife, before continuing up the stairs to find his terrified victim hiding under the bed as she calls the police. And after dragging her out and onto the bed to conduct some scientific research with her organs, it immediately cuts to the police in the very same house as they seem to recognise it. The police officers walk up the stairs, confused as to how they seem to recognise the house, before finding a woman's severely mutilated body. The killer's point of view that we just witnessed was on a tape that was sent to the police department over a week ago depicting this exact crime, despite the officers being told now that this woman only passed away a few hours ago. Confused as to how he could possibly be sent a tape of a murder before it had even happened, the detective has a hidden camera placed at the mailbox, as it then cuts to another point of view segment depicting the killer breaking into yet another house. After breaking in and knocking a man to the ground who's simply trying to defend himself and his home, the killer decides to be incredibly rude by throwing him all over the place and making a really big mess. He then proceeds to use the exact same weapon from the previous crime by stripping back all of the flesh from his body, because who needs that much flesh anyway? Once he's done relieving the man of his skin clothes, it then cuts to the police officers in the exact same house where the exact same thing has once again occurred. The detective was sent a tape by an unknown person three days ago depicting these exact events, despite once again the kill being fresh. Finally, the detective gets a lead as a person is caught on camera depositing another tape before being apprehended for the heinous crime of being a goth. After he's taken in for questioning, we learn that his name is Gunther and that he's the son of the detective's partner, Bobby. Gunther willingly admits to sending in the tapes, and after some more questioning, finally says that ever since his father bought the family a VHS recorder, he's noticed that it's been capturing his dreams. With it just starting out being small specks of things he vaguely recognised, for it eventually going on to display the entirety of his dreams, with them later going to become true. Much to the detective's complete and utter disbelief, Bobby pulls him aside to tell him that it's actually true, and that it's something that runs in their family, with it even causing his sister to go crazy. We then see what was on the tape that Gunther was caught mailing, and once again it reveals another horrific murder. But this time it displays an address, so hopefully they can get there to intervene before it all plays out. So after arriving outside of the house, while still sitting in the car, the detective reveals to Bobby that he knows that he had a lawsuit filed against him by the original victim, and that the second victim was her attorney. And before the detective even has any time to register what's about to happen, he's shot in the face by one of his best friends, because words are boring. Bobby, being the killer all along, then enters the house to commit the heinous acts depicted on the tape, 
as we see Gunther wake up in the interrogation room and check the recording back. Knowing what exactly is about to happen, suddenly he hears multiple shots ring out through the building, when his father then walks right into the room and is about to shoot him. But just before he does, an officer fires at Bobby, causing him to fire back, where he proceeds to get a shotgun and kill two more. And as he's walking down the hallway looking for more officers lying in wait, he's suddenly shot in the head from behind for it to reveal that Gunther did it. And with the final tape coming to an end, so does VHS 85, an arguably strong entry in the series, which more or less follows the exact same formula already proven to work, with it having somewhat of the same result, with some of the segments being far better than the others. But that being said, it definitely stands out as a strong entry in the series, despite its formula starting to run its course, which just leaves me wondering where they'll take things in the future. So before this video comes to an end, I'd like to just give a massive thank you and a big shout out to all of the YouTube members and patrons, the people who every month, despite YouTube not exactly being fond of the type of content I make, continue to support the channel to help it keep going. If you're interested in becoming a YouTube member or a patron yourself, not only are you just generally being a great help, but you also get access to a few little bonuses, like being able to join the private Discord server, where you'll then be granted access to uncensored versions of all videos going forward. So this week, I want to give a big thank you to Aborius K01, JC Cubit, DWNY, and Dylan Barton. So once again, a massive shout out to all of the YouTube members and patrons, and a big thank you to everyone else for watching.